here to learn about what in many cases are very beautiful rocks, um, pegmatites, uh, minerals, but also rocks that can be highly, highly useful in a commercial uh, perspective. And our speaker tonight, Mark Jacobson, is somebody I've known since 1981, Mark? I think that was our first uh, interaction. But Mark has a bachelor's in mineralogy and geochemistry from Penn State, a master's in geology from UC Berkeley. Uh, when he finished graduate school, he worked uh, a little bit for Amico. Unfortunately, he saw um, the right way and came to work for Chevron Corporation, <laughs> as I did. Um, and we both had long and mostly enjoyable careers with Chevron. He retired after 35 years in 2013. Um, he's published numerous articles on the geology and mineralogy of pegmatites, going back as far as 1978 as well. As well, he has published two books, guidebooks to the, the Guidebook to the Pegmatites of Western Australia, 2007, and Antero, anybody know the collegiate range down in uh, uh, the west, down in Colorado, or just south of the collegiate peaks is uh, Mount Antero, and if you're a mineral collector, uh, you know the name Antero, so Antero Aquamarines Minerals from the Mount Antero White Mountain Region, J.P. County, Colorado. He has been a consulting editor for Rock and Minerals magazine since 1984 and is currently president of the Colorado chapter of the Friends of Mineralogy. Uh, he also has some experience with uh, Wyoming's relatively uh, poor, uh, compared to Colorado, pegmatite uh, sites, and he's published articles on the Copper Mountain uh, pegmatites, the Black Mountain Spodumene pegmatite, and Catherine pegmatite on Casper Mountain. So those are all examples from Wyoming. He'll talk a little bit about that, uh, some of that at the very end here. But unfortunately, Wyoming is relatively pegmatite poor, um, so most of what Mark will show you is from other, uh, other great locations around the world. So without further ado, I'd just like to ask you to join me in welcoming Mark Jacobson. Uh, 
this, of course, is exactly what I said we were going to talk about again. And the uh, only thing I left out was I am going to, at the end, talk a little bit about Wyoming pegmatites. So that if you want to go out and dig on your own, there are places you can go. They're, they're not going to be quite as radically beautiful as this, but they still will be attractive and you'll still have a great time uh, collecting them. Now, let's start basic, which is what is a granite? Well, first of all, there's a good picture of a granite. Uh, if you've been hiking up in the Grand Tetons, you see lots of granites uh, exposed in the core and big blocks of long trails. Granites made up of basically three minerals, biotite, uh, a potassium feldspar, and a sodium feldspar called plagioclase, quartz, and uh, a little bit of uh, horn blend and some other minerals. But the four minerals you see there, they make up about 95, 98% of what a granite is. So, what's a pegmatite? Well, pegmatite is extremely coarse-grained. So, for example, those green tourmalines you see through there, they're about five to six inches apiece. Uh, and what makes it, sets a pegmatite apart from granite is not that it's just big grains, big crystals, ones that exceed this, but they also have little grains. So it's a mixture of little and big. And here we have the two of them together. And the important thing that people need to appreciate is they have the same composition. So you see these big crystals of, of tourmaline or of lithium mica or other things that you would call exotic. And you say, well, how can that be? Well, all the exotics, all the rare minerals, all the things that people search for, they make up 3 to 5% of the whole body. So that they have the same composition as a granite. And here's one of the examples that another researcher used. So if, you have, if you've never seen these before, you basically you've got three minerals: <coughs> quartz at the top, potassium feldspar here, sodium here. And you can read the percentages off on the side. And the important part is here it is. You've got different kinds of pegmatites, and there's the granite that they all came from, and they're all the same. Now. That's, so we take care of the composition, you know about the grain size. Now let's talk about how they sort of move. Because most pegmatites arise, are given birth from a parental granite. So you have a parent, and the parent says, okay, it's time to grow up, and sends them screaming off away from them, throws them out of the house. How far can they move? Well, luckily people can go thousands and thousands of miles. Pegmatites don't have feet. They can't go as far. They can only go about, 10 kilometers. So here we have a parental granite, which actually sits buried and comes down to here. And here you have all the pegmatites. And almost all of them are not only within 10 kilometers of here, but also 10 kilometers down. So they're close. They don't go far from home. Now, what does it look like in cross section? So here now we're, that was the map view. Now we're looking at it vertically, sliced through the earth. So there's the parent granite. Fine grain, just like the picture I showed you. It gets slightly coarse grained and it's called a pegmatitic granite. And it forms usually on the shallowest portions of a granite. And then the children get chased off. They're still liquid and they get pushed off either directly into the country rock or they love to find fractures. Sort of like an expressway away. And so they travel through these big fractures. And the ones that contain the most amount of rare elements, you know, that 3 to 5%, they get to run the furthest away. So here they are up here. Now, you don't see them out here because if you're going to, they have a short time before they turn from molten to rock. So in that short time, they, you know, they can't travel fast if there's no fractures. And these are the ones that a lot of people chase after. Now, let's talk about how do they crystallize. Because remember, they start out as a molten liquid rock, buried deep in the earth. And we know just like with you know, cooking material, if you cool them down, they're going to turn solid. Now, but they're not like salt and water or sugar and water. So what happens is that when they're supposed to start crystallizing, they can't because the way the bonding works of the different elements, they can't start crystallizing. It's sort of like they're forced to stay liquid. So what happens is, and here we have time, versus increasing temperature upwards. 
So we're, we're liquid up here. We cool it off. This is the normal freezing point. If we were dealing with ice, that would be 32 degrees. You get just below 32, and of course it's ice. But molten rock doesn't work that way. It gets through there. It knows it wants to crystallize, but it can't. The, the atoms just can't form the structures. So you, it keeps on getting cooler and cooler until finally it's, it's had enough time and it's cool enough, and it's actually the most time, that it starts crystallizing. So the difference in temperature between when a pegmatite crystallizes and when it's supposed to crystallize is called undercooling. Okay, that's just the term. What it means in a simple sense is that the molten rock is super saturated. So it really <coughs> wants to crystallize. So what happens is when you make it undercooled and it starts crystallizing, it really tries to go fast because it's got too much. And in a short time, it becomes solid. This is relative and there's other things we'll talk about in a little while. But the important takeaway is that pegmatites don't crystallize when they're supposed to from chemical means. So that basically they don't crystallize at equilibrium. And so that they, are, they crystallize at disequilibrium, which simply means not equilibrium. Now, you might say, now, when you're working with salt or sugar, when you make something super saturated, you end up with tiny crystals. But that's an ionic substance. Molten rock does not behave that way. It behaves like a bunch of, a, of people wandering around bumping into each other. And, and, and until they can stop bumping, they can't crystallize. So what happens is you make them very, very cool, so they want to crystallize fast. So what happens is they crystallize fast. But because of the different elements, they can't, you don't get little crystals, you get big ones. Because they, what happens is, as you form a crystal, the easiest place to, to put another element onto is on an existing crystal. You, it's easier to build a crystal bigger than it is to start a new one. Think of it as a house. You got five people and you all want to build a house. And you want to build a house as fast as possible. If you each try to build the house yourself, it's, it's going to take a long time. But if you all work together and build one house, it's going to be big. So that's, in a sense, that's what happens to a pigmentite. Now, one of the hallmark signs of a pigmentite is called graphic graphic. Here's an example of it. Now, what started off the science or knowledge of how they form was two guys, actually one this one here, Finn, the other one is named Swanson. And they both had a laboratory and they took molten rock and they made it cool fast. When they did this, they didn't know what was going to happen, but they did. And they ended up creating this same growth in little pieces of rock about this big. This, and some of the primary research took place in Stanford. And that made people realize how we can make big crystals fast. Now, here we are in Wyoming. One of the other signs of a pegmatite is what is called, often called mine rock. And this is up in Fremont County. And these are all, this is very a classic feature called layered apolite. This is just, again, it's just a name. Fine, it's fine grained though. That's the thing about it, is it is pegmatite, but it's fine grained. <coughs> But you do get the big crystals, like I said. So that's a eight-pound sledgehammer. You can guess the crystal goes from there and disappears over there. And that's a classic little crystal. Now, how do we, you know? I, I gave you a theory of how this was done. So how do we really know that? Well, later scientists just took high-temperature, high-pressure bombs, as they call them. They're made out of metal. They're called bombs because they don't explode. You can hold them together. And they went and took molten rock, took powdered rock, melted it, cooled it quickly, opened it up, sliced it, and they were able to create miniature little pegmatites. So there you have your quartz core, your, your feldspar zone, and your graphic granite out here. So the knowledge that this is how pegmatites form is not just mathematical calculations. It's physically creating small ones. And 
One of the classic features of pegmatites is that they're often zoned, meaning that there are different minerals are found in different places. And here's a classic zoning. In the very center, you have pure quartz. Around the edges, you have rock that looks just like granite, not too big. Then you have coarser grains as you get in. When you get into this area, now you're talking about crystals that are going to be this big or more. And some of the most fun things to dig are the crystals that are found around here. So for, if you're a collector, if you go out and you dig things, what you want to do is look for, not, you don't dig in the quartz, you dig around the edges. And collectors have learned this for many, many years, that that's the places you go to find the pretty things. Now, here's one from a mine in uh, Maine. It's a vertical cut. This is about eight feet in height. There's metamorphic rock. There's a fine-grained contact right there in red. That's mica. Then you have feldspar. Down here you have the layered rock. Black tourmaline is there. And then up here you've got red garnet. And this area here is often called the pocket zone. And that's where occasionally you get these hollow spaces full of clay and, and big gemmy crystals. Now, what are the special elements in the pegmatites? Again, they're 3 and 4 percent. But those are the ones that give rise to the interesting crystals. And to do that, you have to have, these are fluxes. So you've got boron, fluorine, phosphorus. Those elements, besides going into special rare minerals, they also have the effect of keeping the rock liquid longer. <coughs> By keeping it liquid longer, you have the ability to make it cool. You can cool it quicker, and it still stays liquid. Now, what I've been trying to lead up to is, again, is, is how long do these things take to crystallize? Is it one year? Is it a million years? And we had a, bunch, a whole bunch of people, so it's not one scientist. They came up with a mathematical model based on temperature of the rock it's pushed into, <clears throat> the temperature of the molten rock that it starts with. Now, other scientists have done great laboratory experiments to say that if your rock has this composition and this much water, it will have, it will crystallize at this temperature. Now, here's the important thing. I've been talking about it being a molten rock. No, it's not a lava. It's not going to run down the street, you know, and uh, catch you and get engulfed. You're talking about a molten rock that has the same as tar on the highway or peanut butter. So you can easily outrun peanut butter if you build a map note and it slides down. Here we have a pigmentite in California. It's 82 feet thick, which by the way is, is it's not, they get a lot bigger, but it's a good average thickness. This one was mined for lithium ore and you can see the pieces of it they left behind. It was also mined for gemstones, and that's actually what it is today. This mine's still in operation just for gemstones. And here's one of the ores they took out. Fine grain, purple mica. It was originally mined for its lithium and used in glass making in about 1920. So here we have the, the mathematical model. You have country rock at a cool temperature, and there's the starting Right. There's the starting temperature of the country rock. Then you inject your pegmatite in. It starts out at 650 degrees. And then by mathematics, based on the, the properties of the rock, you can, you can calculate how long it will take to cool. Well, we know from other experiments that it has to cool at 550. To get that whole rock to cool at 550, you're looking at less than a, actually, here in nine years, is that right? Yeah, there we go. It's about nine years. So we're talking fast. When the dikes are thinner, they crystallize in weeks and months. If they get thicker, you know, you could get them up to 100 years, but they're, they're fast. Now, they form in many different environments. Okay, so here we have depth under the earth. Here we have temperature. And this shows you the different conditions we have of different kinds of rock. This path is the path that, without anything unusual, as you move down under the earth, 
it gets warmer and warmer, which, by the way, is how you get hot springs. Because if you take water from down here and you bring it to the surface really quick, you have a hot spring. And so you get simple pegmatites of different kinds at deeper depths. But the ones that people like are at about 2 kilobars or about 5 uh, five kilo kilometers below the surface. So the pegmatites you see at the surface today, they were formed quite deep, but not as deep as some other things. Now, that's the, the, those are the key things about how a pegmatite forms. Same composition as a granite. Coarse crystals. They do not crystallize the equilibrium. They crystallize fast. And they can only get 10 kilometers from home before they're trapped. <laughs> but what are they used for? Well, one of, one of the earliest uses of them was in mica. And here we have, really early, mica was used as ornaments by Native American Hebrews. And you'll find them in burial grounds and mounds, both East Coast and West Coast. Uh, later on, they were used turn of the century, they would be used as washers because of their heat properties. They, since you can see through mica, they would be used for glazing. In other words, if you had a, a flame, if you had a lantern, that you had a flame in it, gas, candle, kerosene, you could use mica as your windows. And if you dropped it, the windows wouldn't break. Uh, they were also used for capacitors and electronics. So they were very useful and are still useful. And when they were mined at the turn of the century, they were they cost a lot of money. And this is one 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 miner, his own mine, he's mining his own property. These things sold once they were trimmed and cut back at the turn of the century, five dollars. Prices back then per pound. So one miner with one mica mine could support his whole family. And that's why you had mining booms throughout the U.S. before 1900 for mica. Now, you had coal companies formed for mica. And talk about employment. This, I like this photograph especially. This is one mica trimming plant for, in, in New Hampshire, all, all wives, some single, some married, uh, employed to trim mica, while well, the men did the hard work blasting and carting it out of the ground. Now, this group here was employed by one pegmatite, one owner. So this, these were not trivial businesses. Mica mining made mine owners sometimes very wealthy. And, and you can take this as either good or bad, they employed children. Uh, so here it is, you've got, I mean, some of these are clearly close to the age of 10 doing the trimming. Now, that's my turn. Then we go to feldspar. That's probably the most popular use of mining. So feldspar is you know, basically cleansing powders or, or basically scouring powders. And you use it in ceramics and you use it in glass. Uh, it's still used that way today. Here's what the feldspar looks like. That's plain ore feldspar. That's a feldspar crystal which by the way is about a, about a foot, it's about this big, came out of a, a pocket in, uh, in South Dakota. <coughs> and this is a picture of the, uh, the, the uh, basically the company that mines it in Custer, South Dakota, still in operation. That's the stockpile, that's the mill where it's crushed and graded. Uh, they're still active, but they don't have that many mines because the the major uses, there's a lot of other competition for the, the feldspar. And here's one of the quarries that's, actually this one is intermittently active in Colorado. That's said to be the largest feldspar mine in Colorado and it's still occasionally used. Uh, and it's just mined with blasting dump trucks and loaders. Quartz, white quartz. Uh, white quartz is, has a little more esoteric use. It is used for glass. It's also used for paving stones. This is from a street in downtown Denver. Uh, instead of using regular crushed rock, you can use quartz. It wears just as well and it looks prettier on the sidewalk. 
but you, there's a whole, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of uses. Norway has loads of pegmatites and very, very clean white quartz. And they still mine it there, and they still have applications. But it's not just them. Here, this one's in India. They, there's their stockpile, and they turn it into white powder. So it's in the US, because the labor cost is not as commonly used, overseas, a lot more places still mine it. Why is it white rather than clear? Why is it, okay, the question was, why is it white rather than clear? Ah, uh, if to have clear, you can't have little, okay, a lot of the inclusions that make it white are little tiny air bubbles. Well, I call them air bubbles. Sorry, they're little tiny bubbles of either fluid inclusions or uh, CO2 inclusions. And so it's, it's, the, it's the inclusions that cause the light to not be able to pass through it. So it's not due to chemical impurities. This is another quartz mine. Uh, the quartz core used to stand up like that, and they took it out and used it as decorative garden rock in Colorado. Now, another great use, berlinium. Now, in the US, things have changed. But it's used for spark plugs. One of its great attributes is that it conducts electricity, but it will not spark. And certain environments, if you have a, you have a spark, you'll blow the whole place up. Uh, so it's used in places where you have moving parts that you can't afford to have. It's also used in metal alloys that have special properties. It's used in electronics. And there you have it in, within a spark plug. Now, one other use that's not as popular is it used, used to be used in control rods during World War II. It still uses control rods, but it was, you know, nuclear reactors were new then. So it, it was a top secret mining, and the USGS tried to keep it a secret that they were trying to find out how much burl did the U.S. have. Now, in, after the war in 66, the U.S. government decided burl was a critical supply. We needed it. So they subsidized its price, and said, OK, you bring this burl, and we'll pay you a fixed price. And it set off a mining boom across the whole country, including Wyoming up in the Cabo Mountain District. And if that subsidy lasted, I'm sorry, it started in 56. They stopped the subsidy in 66. And in 66, a new source of burl was found in Utah that caused the price to drop. So since that time in the US, burl is no longer economic. In the US, overseas, where labor costs are lower, people still chase all over the place for it. Now, when it was economic and, and labor costs were low in the US, it, this is how it was mined. You'd blow, you'd blow the rock up, you'd go through it by hand, and you'd sort it out. Well, Bart Montgomery is over there. He's the guy who owned the mine. And when this operation was over, he donated the mine to the University of New Mexico so that you could actually go there as a visitor and as a tourist. So the mine is still open to the public for visiting. And if you go to the dump, you can still find burl pieces all over the place. Not particularly pretty, but that's what they mined it for. Now, it sometimes gets nice, interesting crystals. That's or burl. But when it's nice and gemmy, and it can be blue, it can be pink. We'll have other pictures, as you'll see. Now. Like I said, it's still mining for burl still continues overseas. And here you have where they were mining it in India, and they were trying to smuggle it to China and got caught. So this is customs confiscated these. The stuff that makes it over the border uh, is stockpiled and then resold to other people. Now, lithium is another major reason why pegmatites in the have been mined. Uh, it's used, of course, today you know, everybody knows about lithium batteries, both for cars, uh, motorcycles, uh, cell phones. It's also used as a grease, and it does have all sorts of pharmaceutical uses. And it's got three, it has different ores, spodumene, pedalite, lipidolite, and bligonite. And bligonite, they're different minerals, but the major ones are the first two. So what does spodumene look like? Long, white, fibrous crystals. 
That's a, that's a single crystal that's about uh, <coughs> a foot in height. It's about this big. And this comes from South Dakota. This is what more typical ore burl looks like, just broken little crystals. And you just crush it and purify it. The other mineral, which is petalite, now has the same composition as spongy, but it has a different shape. As you can see, it's just white blobs. If I took you into a quarry that had petalite all over the floor, you wouldn't recognize it. It looks just like feldspar. Uh, that's about all I can say is that you have to be taught what it looks like, and then you can recognize it. Now, they're mined in, in several different places around the world. Green bushes here. This pit, by the way, is, is about 600 meters deep, which makes it 900 feet. Uh, that road just keeps going down. And this is uh, one of the major suppliers and reserves uh, outside of China for spongy or lithium. Now, the stuff that comes out of that mine, though, is really ugly. It looks like sugar. This is basically, it's a pinkish color, as you can see. Fine grained, a little bit glassy. Looks like granulated sugar that's been dissolved and then mushed back together. Now, what I'm going, doing is going from old to new. So each of these uses are more modern uses and they're more important. Tantalum is it's used in your cell phones. Without tantalum, you probably wouldn't have a cell phone. Or the cell phone might have to be this big because you'd have to substitute something for it. It's used in hospital applications where you want a hard metal that's strong, not going to break, not going to fracture, not going to wear down. Because you, if you put this in a person, you want it to stay there for the rest of its life. You don't want to have to replace it because the metal wore out. Uh, it's used in as I said, in transistors and other mechanical parts. It's found in three or four different minerals. Microlite, little blubs like this, they're not very big, but if you have that making up 5% of a rock that you can quarry with a dump truck, you have an ore. And in different places around the world, this stuff is extremely valuable. It also comes in the middle tendal, hemlite, which is, now that's black, that's heavy, that's fractured, but the normal ore for this, again, comes in grains that are one to two millimeters in size, but you basically mine it by the ton. And all you do is you crush it, and you just let the, the fact that it's so heavy separate out the light material, and the major mines around the world do really well. And for a while, the second largest producer of tantalum came from Wojina in northern Australia. This is the processing plant. Uh, it was discovered in 02. In, during World War II, the US needed uh, tantalum, because it actually was then used as surgical parts. It was used both for its electrical properties, or shall we say its, its strength, and it was also used for people who had skull damage, and they had to basically protect the skull. They use it literally to act as a skull replacement. It's inert in the human body. It's strong. You're not going to break it. You're not going to crush it by having a guy hit him on the head. And where was the US going to get it? Well, the US didn't have the supplies. They actually went and bought it from Australia, put it in a boat, and shipped it over to Chicago, where it was refined. So this, without this, we would have not had this this strategic mineral during World War II. Now, we're down to the last mineral that's, that it's mined, that's mined today. Cesium, really, really rare. Uh, it's used in solar cells. So all these solar farms that are starting to spring up everywhere, if you don't have cesium, you're going to have a hard time making electricity. It's obviously, it's also used in diodes. So if you have these cold lights, uh, that's important. And of course, if you're, if you're in the oil industry and you want to complete your wells without formation damage, where the wells are high pressure, use this in your completion pool. These are, 
their esoteric uses, but they all supply a critical need for the U.S. as well as for the world. Well, where does, this is what the ore looks like. It looks like basically yellow and white glassy stuff. If the petalite was difficult to recognize, this is worse. Uh, you can go through place after place and you just, you might be looking at it and you might not. Uh, it takes some real training and a trained eye to have a chance to identify it. And I'll admit, even to this day, you know, there's times I go into a place and I know it's there, but I can't see it. This is the stuff that's really hard to tell. It's not glassy, it's just opaque, dull white. It's not dense than other stuff. So it, you almost have to suspect it and analyze it. So where does it come from? Okay, today there's only one supplier that's known in the world. China keeps its supplies secret, meaning that they, whether they have it or not. But outside China, the only place is in Canada. It's a pegmatite that's under this lake. It's a completely underground mine. That's pure petalite. The little petalite zone also has some petalite. And this, since 1974, has been the world supplier of cesium for all the various applications. Now, China did let out historical information as to where they got their polyacite, or their cesium. And it's this giant pit. When this pit was in production from about 1949, when the Russians came in and started helping operate it, uh, until probably the 70s, yes, 76, they, they kept this mine secret. Westerners were not even allowed to know it existed. Now that it's depleted, not only can we know it's existed, can you see pictures of it on the web, but if you go there, they'll give you a guided tour. It's basically geotourism. And they'll take you down and you can actually visit here. Now, now we get to the really fun stuff, the gems. So here, we're not dealing with corporations anymore. Now the, the gem mining is done by individuals. You'll have one or two people who own a mine. They'll either do it by themselves, or maybe they'll have three people, or maybe they'll just be themselves. And they go for the real pretty stuff. So tourmaline, which is found in the pockets, uh, get, that's what it looks like naturally. And there's a whole array of cut ones. <clears throat> this particular mine is owned by a surveyor. That's what he does for a living. But his hobby for the last 15 years is he owns his own pegmatite mine. And he's just been mining it off and on for 15 years for the fun of it. And once in a while, he'll sell it. But most of the time, he just keeps it. Uh, Himalaya, Southern California, had, is a, a mine that has been known since 1898 for gems. During its heyday before 1912, the mine produced more than five tons of gem material. Uh, the mine con continues to operate under different people over time and operation today. Now, it's the specimens that bring lots of bucks. These specimens you see here, for example, could be anywhere from, oh, $5,000 to $30,000 a piece. And more specimen grade material is where the tourmaline is just pink, set in lapidolite. It's specimen grade. You can't make a gemstone out of it, but it's, collectors love it. Oh, this piece here is, uh, it's, it's, that's thing's 60 pounds. And I had to carry it from the mine to my rental car. <laughs> now, I was younger then. <laughs> topaz. Okay, everybody has topaz gemstones, especially the blue ones. That's from Colorado, it's only two inches. And China has, has had topaz gemstones for decades. This one is six inches tall. Uh, these gemstones, these topazes, from uh, Inner Mongolia has been known since uh, the 20s. And, of course, pearl, which comes in different colors. This was a mine that was known since 1858, where it was mined for gemstones, not for ore pearl. And the best, biggest mining occurred just before World War I. So there's Big Crystal, 
and there's a small one for a faster one. That's about seven inches in length, and it's in the Harvard collection. And of course, in Colorado, there's a whole bunch of people out there digging aquamarines from the Colorado localities, and John Melby, for decades, faceted aquamarines there. He'd go out and he'd dig them on his claim, and this is one he found in, yeah, in 07. And he didn't cut this one. The, the cutters cut the broken crystals, not the complete ones. So this one here still exists. And he, he cut them, and then he'd sell them to his friends. Uh, the reason they went to his friends is everybody wanted them. Uh, there, there was no argument over price. It was availability. Now, this one I like. This really is this pink. Uh, Cold Morganite, named after J.P. Morgan, as a <laughs> an emotional present of man by Frederick Coons. Uh, that is purple. It is that purple. Uh, that's about this big. And, of course, we have spodumene. I told you about ore spodumene. Now we have gem spodumene, which is also a pink. That's Frederick Coons, and about 1910. And that crystal he holds up there is this one. And the, the interesting story about why this gemstones became called Kunzite, being named after Frederick Kunz, was he was jealous of his friend, Earl Hidden, who had Hiddenite named after him, which is a green spodgy. The two of them were competitors, but they, they were friendly. And when this was discovered, the local people gave it a local name called California Lilac. And Kunz got a professor in New York City he said to him, he said, look, please describe this and name it after me. Yeah. Hmm. And Baskerville, that was his name, Charles Baskerville, said, OK. So he described it, published it <coughs> as his name, and voila. He now has his own uh, gemstone, and he feels now on equal parity with Earl Hidden. Uh, there's another Kunzite. Uh, there's a cup one there. This is a, an old mine that was discovered in uh, 1903 during the heyday of the gem mines in Southern California. Now, Colorado, of course, now we're, we're run out of the faceted stones. Now we're just talking about the stuff that's pretty. This specimen called the porcupine was mined by Joe Doris just maybe, did I wrote it in there? I did. That's about uh, 06. That's probably a, a 10 to $25,000 specimen. It sits about this big. Uh, absolutely gorgeous as it looks here. Now we get to Wyoming. And Wyoming has had a lot of mining. Uh, Mica in, near Torrington before 1920. It's had some burl mines at different places, the Haincob stuff. And the best Feldspar mine <coughs> in the state is at, on Casper Mountain. Okay. These are the known pegmatites in the state. Uh, they're scattered around. They're, they're not gemstones. They're all specimen type materials. Burl, Casper Mountain. Uh, this, that's, that's about this long, which would make it maybe eight inches, nine inches. Uh, not gem quality, just, it's just considered attractive. This one here is about, only about four or five inches in size. Uh, also in a, a very nice white feldspar. And well, now we jump over to Copper Mountain near uh, Shoshone in Fremont County, and you get some small metallic minerals. This is tapiolite, which is a, a tantalum mineral, and tantalite itself. They're, they're not too big, but to get them nice and sharp crystals, is very, very rare. So if you actually find things like this in Wyoming, uh, they do have value. You're not, not going to become wealthy, but you'll have a lot of people very envious of the fact that you've got nice specimens. <laughs> uh, Petalite is found up in the Copper Mountain area near Shoshone. Uh, lots and lots of it there. Most people don't know it's petalite. They think of it's feldspar, so there's no shortage of that for people who want to go collect. 
And we do have paint tourmaline in Wyoming, again, from Copper Mountain. Copper Mountain is the one area that I would say that if you want to find a, the largest number of different minerals that are pretty, it's the place you can go. It's, it's on public land, meaning on BLM land, and that, yeah, on BLM land, there is a public road into it. Uh, you can camp out there, you can go hunting, and you can go mineral collecting. And you've got, the, there's the purple lapidolite in a form called, uh, it's nodular, it looks like little round balls. Uh, that's about, I think about four inches. One ball is about four inches. Now, Black Mountain, also on BLM land, you can actually drive up to that one also if you can figure out how, where the deep trail is. It's on the mountain, oops, let's go back, and it's just gray spodumene. There's not enough there to be an ore mineral, but spodumene is rare in the state, but there are specimens that you can find there. Now, that's the, the quick, quick overview of what pegmatites are used for and how they form. Uh, pegmatite research is still expanding across the U.S. as well as in the world. There's still a lot of unanswered questions about how they form, what controls their sizes, what controls their distributions. Uh, outside the U.S., pegmatite mining still increases where labor costs are low. Gem mining, because gem mining represents only one and two man operations, uh, that's actually increasing. It's the in thing to quickly find your own pegmatite, claim it, mine it for yourself, and hope that you find gems. Uh, there's a lady in Thermopolis who, fe who went up to Copper Mountain and found an area of fine grained purple mica. She took about, she said there was five tons of it. And she carted it out and she polishes it so it makes bright purple masses and sells it in her rock shop. Hmm. And of course, recreational collecting is still significant in the U.S. Uh, you can still do it. There's still enough public lands. And if there are private lands, you just contact the landowner. I found in most cases, if you go to the landowner and you tell them, hey, this is who I am. This is what I want to do. You can come with me. I'll show you what I'm doing. Most of them will say, oh, OK. But as long as you close the gates when you're done. Now, if you liked what what I talked about, and you want to get a written discussion uh, with better examples and more references, this is a, a magazine or an issue that you can actually write to, and they will, you can, they'll send, you can pay for it, and they'll send it to you. It's not out of print. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Let's see if I can repeat your question. The, the, the last question was, is, is there a relationship between serpentine and pegmatitic rocks? Okay. The answer to that is, is no. Uh, 
Uh, Technotites are uh, alumino, they're mostly alumino silicates that are, that are in a framework, meaning that they're very, very well bonded. Serpentine is a hydrated olivine. Now, hydrated meaning water. Olivine is a mineral that's composed of iron, magnesium, silicate, no aluminum, and it also is typical of higher temperature than pegmatites. But the real reason is that, it, that serpentine is, is something that forms close to the surface due to olivine basically sucking in the water and changing uh, so it. So it's, uh, serpentine is actually a near surface creation, while well, pegmatites are the two, five, two to five kilometers below the surface. So, yes. going to the Tetons to see great big crystals, is it okay to call those pegmatite, or are they not really? Oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's you are exactly spot on. Uh, you hike on those trails, and you'll see peg, little pegmatites from this thin up to this big, uh, composed of coarse grains, of quartz and feldspar, they're all over the place. So, yes, you are seeing pegmatites in the Grand Tetons. And the, if you think about it this way, you take a granite body, it's molten. If you take that molten body and squish that molten mass into colder rocks, then you're going to get a pegmatite. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not going to have rare minerals because it doesn't have enough of the, of the rarer elements, but it'll still have the grain size that says it's pegmatite. So yeah, uh, we were hiking there today. And I got pictures of, of little pegmatites just shot through it everywhere I was walking. And then there's, it seems like the mica is the last thing to come out, or they're kind of crammed in there, or is that not? How the do the mica fit in? The mica comes out with all of them. A lot of it is, is crystallizing pretty much at the same time, because you're right, there's little black biotite crystals scattered. Well, that's actually big for a granite, but that's small for a pegmatite, uh, scattered in the pegmatites that are in the granite.
is freely traded on the world market, why would uh, India be upset with it being smuggled into China? Well, I could argue that, it, that each country has the right to put uh, restrictive tariffs uh, on their mineral commodities. And as you know, uh, China, was it four years ago? in retaliation because they got angry at Japan, cut off the world's supply of rare earth elements and set, set the rest of the world markets into a panic. And the price just tripled, quadrupled four times. And there was all sorts of political concern about how dare they do this. You know, uh, now, of course, the price has gone back down again. And the whole thing had to do with uh, a long-term animosity related to World War II between Japan and China. Uh, the US and Europe were just collateral damage. Uh, so India has a tense relationship with China due to uh, the handling of the Dalai Lama and Tibet. So it may be basically a squabble between the two of them. Yes. referring to the Spore Mountain deposits in, in near Delta. Yeah. Are you? Yeah, in Western Delta. Yeah. But if you are, that that beryllium ore is composed of uh, a half a percent to a percent of a ber bertrandite, which is beryllium, hydrated beryllium oxide. And it, that by itself does not have a purple color. It's actually white. So if the ore rock you're talking about is purplish in color, it would be due to the fact that it's being mined on a volcanic tooth, uh, ashlow tuff. So I can't explain the color. It would not be from the burl ore part of the rock. But it's not a Oh no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, it's it's not a pegmatite. It's a it's a volcanic it's a volcanic rock extrusive on the surface. Early tertiary, okay. Early tertiary. 
uh, Bhutans, and some of them are, some of them are in uh, Bathos, like the Isle of Bathos. All those bodies contain uh, pegmatites, uh, a lot of them gem pegmatites, killer aquamarines, some of them getting up like this, uh, topazes, sherry colored topazes like that, fabulous stuff. They all sit either in the national forest or in wilderness areas. And since about 1988, the Forest Service has clamped down uh, legally, physically, confiscation-wise uh, lawsuits to try to stop all the collectors from, from bringing it out. And all that material that did exist and still exists and is still being dug has gone underground. You don't see it in publications, you don't see it in publicly displayed things, but yes, that material is still there, is still being found. It's just that the political environment has made it inappropriate to acknowledge its existence. <laughs> Do the size of Bathalus correlate with the gemstones that are found or the rare elements? There's, there's really no correlation between size of bathroom or size of pluton. Uh, it's, it's more a matter of how evolved the granite was and whether the granite was able to push off molten granite into colder rocks. Uh, it, so that's the, sort of the control. This is like her question. So, um, how much cesium is there? Is there a sedimentary source of that? If if that's a limit, a limiting factor on solar, then where does that put us? Okay. It doesn't take much cesium to do the solar the solar cells. Uh, and in the, in, in the year. now you said cesium in the sediments. Yeah, you, you said that you have the the. Um, the, the brine variety of lithium, uh, is there something like that for cesium, or, or is it only in pegmatites that you can get cesium? Okay, cesium is, is only in pegmatites. Mm -hmm. Lithium is in the brines, yes. Mm -hmm. did, did that yes, answer? You answered my question. Okay. Size and how it forms. 
And uh, yes, gabbros, wing pigmentites, all these <coughs> bodies, even if they're mafic, have the potential to make mafic pigmentites. Mm -hmm. It's just that they're less common. And there's, there's other reasons I can go into as to why, but no, we, don't, we don't have that kind of time. <laughs> but yes, they are valid, and they are considered pigmentites, yes. Uh, so, I, I take it there's no more questions? Or at least we've run out of time. Right, well, we have a well, Art will be here for a little, a little few right. minutes while we take things apart, too. Right. So, before we do the chair shuffle, uh, in two weeks we also have another. Darren Larson, Darren Larsonberg, about the uh, cores from the lakes here along the base of the Tetons, trying to figure out when, how often the Teton fault is moved. Right, which, if you live here and you care about earthquakes, might be of interest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mark, this is for you on behalf of the geologist of Jackson Hole. Okay. Sideways, please. I won't. And, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.